thing that the Lord has done in our lives. He's been so good to us, and I cannot praise Him enough. Very quickly today, we got a lot of folks that are out this afternoon. We got folks on holiday and vacation. It's that time of year, folks. Yes, Sister Drennan, you are here. Uh, need to pray for Eddie and Geraldine because they got to Myrtle Beach this, uh, I believe, on Friday and uh, immediately got kicked out of the hotel. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so we need to need to pray for them. They did find them another hotel, but. The hotel they've been going to for 20 years. They go there the same week every year. They've been going there 20 years, and they finish up this week, and then they make reservations for next year. And they go back every year, and uh, the hotel sold uh, to some different folks. and uh, They ain't doing things the same. And they run them off, kicked them out. But anyhow, I guess they're having a good, enjoyable time. I got a kick out of aggravating Dee Dee about getting kicked out of the hotel uh, on the first day of their holiday. But anyhow, uh, we are thankful that you're here, and we pray for everyone that is traveling and on holiday and just enjoying some downtime. Sometimes everybody has to, it's good to get a few days away and just clear your mind from everything. Amen. Uh, but uh, we appreciate those of you that are here. We appreciate all of our folks that join us uh, so regularly on the live stream. We appreciate you. We say it every week, coast to coast, border to border, shore to shore, sea to shining sea, and around the world. I literally got a uh, message this week in my inbox from a uh, dear brother in India, uh, who said that he watches our live stream every single week. He said he doesn't catch it when we're live, but he catches it uh, after the fact and said that it's been such a blessing uh, to him. We're just grateful that we have this technology we can use to reach folks that aren't even in our local vicinity. Um, we had a little bit of technical issue earlier, uh, but anyhow, I want to uh, make mention I can't get our slide up, but I want to make mention of our annual camp meeting, which is uh, going to be coming off in just a few weeks here. Uh, we are in preparation, and uh, we hope that you've already marked your calendar, made plans to be with us. And uh, this isn't so much for those that are here today, but it's just a reminder for those that may be watching for the first time. Uh, about our annual camp meeting convocation, August 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th. Four days of Bible deliverance. We'll kick off Thursday night at 7 o'clock under the Canvas Cathedral, uh, which already stretched high in the air. Uh, we got the stage put up on this past week. Uh, we started hanging curtains. We got all the lights hung. Uh, we're going to put a few more lights. They're going to be delivering uh, some restrooms. Uh, so uh, we're getting ready. Uh, it's just a few weeks away. Thursday night, August the 4th, we'll kick off with one of the most powerful prophetic voices that have ever spoken in our fellowship and ministry. That's prophetess Julie Cross. Uh, this woman of God and her husband, who's now transitioned and gone on, have been friends of Sister Drennan and I's for over 30 years. And uh, what a powerful, powerful woman of God she is. Her prophetic gift is spot on and accurate. She met when we were still in that little storefront building in Sweetwater in 1998. Uh, almost, I guess it was 1999, Sister Drennan had not been to the doctor. Sister Drennan had not received any information about her pregnancy. And Prophetess Julie met Sister Drennan in the hall of that building. Clifford Bivens, you were there. I don't know if you remember it or not, but you were there. Don and Julie were there ministering. Uh, matter of fact, I believe that the Prince of Peace were singing that day. 
and they were ministering, and uh, Julie met Sister Drennan in that hall. You remember that hallway that went down the to the back where the bathroom was at, met her in that hallway and said, I don't know if you know it or not, but you're about to have a baby boy. You're pregnant and going to have a baby boy. And uh, Sister Drennan said, I'm what? And she said, you're pregnant. You're going to have a baby boy. That following week, Sister Drennan went to the doctor and the doctor said, yep, you're pregnant. <laughs> and when they done the ultrasound, uh, uh, sure enough, she she was pregnant with John Caleb. Uh, but anyhow, uh, this woman of God, I have seen her speak over people's lives in so many areas and so many aspects. And God has moved and ministered and blessed uh, in their lives. So you don't want to miss the, very, the kickoff, Thursday night, 7 o'clock. Uh, prophetess Julie Cross will be here as our keynote speaker under the tent. Then Friday night, my friend, 40 years, y'all know the story. What a prophet, 82 years old, still doing the work of God. Still doing the work of God, 82 years old. Most folks retire before they're 82 years old. Uh, but Dr. Woody Martin just keeps on keeping on. And like I said, we've been friends for 40 years almost and uh, still are friends. And uh, he'll be here Friday night as our keynote speaker. Then Saturday night, a statesman of the faith, a man that is a preacher of preachers, an orator of orators, a theologian of theologians, a man with great insight into the Word of God and the ability to communicate God's Word to you in an unprecedented fashion. You won't miss Bishop Kevin Perry for Saturday night live. Then Sunday the 7th, we'll be back in the service here in the chapel uh, at 2 o'clock, and I'll be officiating the final impartation ordination communion service on that Sunday at 2 o'clock in the chapel. We have free hot meals following every service in our pavilion on the other side of this uh, chapel. There's a pavilion over here, and we have free hot meals served every night. Also, parking should be no issue. Uh, we will once again be offering ballet service uh, car parking and shuttle service from both up here at the chapel and the second tier parking area down below. If anybody doesn't want to drive all the way to the tent, uh, we'll have shuttle service to take you to and from the tent and from the tent to the pavilion for uh, our meals. All right. So we're covering all of our bases. Okay. All right, everybody want to get right to the word of God today. We won't keep you any longer with all the preliminaries. Just make sure that you mark your calendar. Those of you that are here, if you haven't already picked up a flyer, they're available on the vestibule table in the back. Grab a flyer to remind you, stick it on your Frigidaire. Uh, and the reason I say put it on your Frigidaire, because that's where we go the most. Uh, and that way you'll get a good reminder, magneted up there, uh, that camp meeting is coming up. Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles today, I want you to turn and, and keep your Bibles handy because we're going to go to, to, to two different passages today. I'll try not to keep you too long this afternoon. Matthew, the 17th chapter. Matthew chapter 17. We're going to begin reading with verse 22. Matthew 17 and verse 22. Then in a few moments we'll be going to Matthew 25. So Matthew 17 22, then we'll go to Matthew 25 in just a few moments. This is what the scripture said. And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men. And they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again. Now watch this. And they were exceeding sorry. Let me read that passage one more time very quickly. 
And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And the third day he shall be raised again. Watch this. And they were exceeding sorry. Will you bow your heads for just one moment with me as we pray and ask God's blessing upon his word today. Father, we thank you in this place. And we praise you and we exalt you and we extol you and we magnify and glorify, lift up and magnograph your holy name. Lord Jesus, today as we have assembled ourselves in this place, these few and fleeting moments that are before us, Lord, we recognize, we identify, and we acknowledge your holy presence. Lord Jesus, today we worship you with the voice of principalities and powers and kingdoms and rulers and dominions throughout this universe with the voice of the four and twenty elders, with the voice of the many-eyed seraphim and six-winged cherubim flying toward one another, covering both their face and their feet. These words today resonate and echo from the depths of our soul along with them. Holy, 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 holy is the Lord our God Almighty. Lord Jesus, today as a consequence of our worship in this place, We pray, oh God, that you would anoint your precious word, that it would be easy to preach in this place and hearing would be a great delight unto the saints. We pray today, Lord, that the archangel of God that tends to the holy altar of God would be commissioned in this time to bring a coal of fire from that holy altar and lay it upon my lips so that the words that I would speak would not be my words, but they would be your words, words of spirit and words of life. Lord, we've come to this place today not for our own good pleasure, but we come here, Lord, to do your perfect will. God, today we humble ourselves in your sight and with grace, gratitude and humility, Lord, we thank you for your divine providence upon us. And as we enter into this time of receiving your word today, we pray that not a soul would leave here without having their needs met without having heard from heaven, without being inspired by the Spirit of Almighty God. And we ask these things in the blessed name of your Son, Jesus Christ, uh, by the power of the consubstantial Holy Spirit. Amen. And let the saints of God in the house say it. Amen. And amen. I want to take just a minute today and lay a little bit of foundation. And we're going to go to the 25th chapter of Matthew here in just a few moments. But as I am laying some foundation and building blocks upon which we are going to erect this word of truth today. I need you to understand what is happening here. Jesus is making one of three prophetic declarations about his purpose here on this earth. Why he came and what is going to happen. He tells his disciples that there's going to be a moment come when he is going to be, number one, betrayed. I could work on that today, but I'm not going to very much, but I'm going to assure you today that even as Jesus was betrayed, you're going to be betrayed at some point in some time by people that are part of your most intimate and inner circle. If anybody knows what I'm talking about, say amen. Uh, Amen. You're going to find yourself being betrayed by the people that you invest the most into. Jesus had spent three years with these 12 men pouring himself into them. And he said, it's coming a point and coming a time that somebody out of my inner circle is going to betray me. Now that's a real consequence here today uh, because the truth is it's just a fact of life. Loyalty is something that most people know very little about. Uh, I've always prided myself on the fact of being a very loyal person. I stay loyal to people. I'm loyal to folks that are very unloyal to me. I'm loyal to people that don't even deserve loyalty. I'm loyal to people that other folks think I shouldn't be loyal to, but I I believe in the principle and the concept 
concept of loyalty. Can somebody say amen here today? That's a good quality and good character to have is to be unmovable and unshakable in your loyalties and commitments. But Jesus said, number one, I'm going to be betrayed. He said, number two, I'm going to be delivered into the hands of men and they are going to kill me. I'm going to be murdered in essence. And he, and he uh, finalized his prophetic prediction by saying, but I'm going to rise again. I'm going to be resurrected or I'm going to get back up. Hello, somebody. And here's the important thing that I want us to notice today in verse number 23. The Bible said that they were very sorry. Uh, now, I was very surprised when I saw this, but after preaching last week's sermon, uh, I began to think about the sorrow of Saturday. Uh, and I don't want to go back and be a, a, a rehash or recant all of last week's sermon. Uh, but you know, last week we preached about the crucifixion. We preached about how that they had to hastily take down the body of Jesus and get him in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea before the sun set on Friday because they had to do it before Sabbath because when Sabbath come, their hands would be tied and his body would fall into the hands of the Romans who did not observe Sabbath and the Romans would burn his body. So the Jews were having to move quickly to get his body down from the cross, get his body interred into the tomb and then go and prepare to anoint his body for burial on Sunday because they couldn't do anything on Saturday. I'm going to work for just a minute. Oh, hallelujah. So uh, uh, what happened was that on Saturday, the reality of the death of Jesus begin to set in. And we know that the Bible said that it was such a uh, a very uh, pressing uh, reality that the other disciples were beginning to be afraid that not only were they going to crucify Jesus as they had, but they too may be killed for their participation in this Jesus uh, revolution. So they had all already made up their mind to go into hiding. Now, this just goes to show how some men's minds work. So on Sunday, rather than the disciples of Jesus going and doing what they should do by anointing the body of Jesus, they sent the women to do the dirty work. Amen. They sent the women because they were disgusted, distressed, and afraid. And as I looked at these passages and I looked at these scriptures, I realized and I saw and I understood that Jesus spent a great deal of his ministry not only teaching his disciples about moral living. We know he taught about love your enemies. Pray for those that despitefully use and persecute you. Do good to those that do evil to you. Come on somebody. We know that Jesus taught a lot about morality. He taught a lot about the right thing to do. But I want you to notice that he also did due diligence in not only teaching about moral living, but he also did due diligence in teaching them about preparation for the hard and the difficult places life was going to create. Jesus spent a lot of time teaching his disciples how to be ready when trouble comes. Hello. He spent a lot of time teaching his disciples how to be ready in the difficult times. 
hearts. And so that's why it is very alarming to me that in chapter 17, after Jesus had set a powerful ongoing example of preparation for the tough times in life, when they heard that Jesus was going to be killed, even though he said, I'm going to get up again, they still felt sorrowful in their soul. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. I, 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 let me work on this. Uh, it was so important for Jesus to teach with his life about the power of preparation uh, that in John's gospel, in the second chapter, the very first miracle of Jesus is chronicled. Uh, and it is a miracle that he worked out of necessity. It was performed out of season and under precarious various circumstances and pressure from his own mother. The Bible said that his mother was catering a wedding at Cana of Galilee. And the scripture tells us that they ran out of wine and his mother did not know what to do. So she called on Jesus to help rectify the situation. And the Bible tells us that Jesus himself actually rebuked his own mother and told her that you're troubling me before my time. But whatever, I'm going to do what I got to do. But I want you to know that this miracle is out of season. It is out of time. It's not the right season or the right time. But he told his disciples, whatever she says, we're going to do it. So go and follow my instructions get some water pots we're going to fill them up and God's going to give us a miracle can I say something to you today Jesus began his ministry by setting an example to us that we got to be ready for whatever comes up amen honey I look around the church and I see folks that have sat in church for years and they understand that we have an enemy and they understand that we have an adversary and they understand that trouble is part of life and they understand that difficult times are going to arise but yet when things happen they are not prepared for the trouble that comes upon them. Jesus' disciples were in the same boat. Oh, help me Holy Ghost. Jesus had already told them. Jesus had already warned them and Jesus had already uh, alerted them about his death but when his death happened, they were ill-prepared. Our text reveals a group of disciples who pretended to understand the purpose of Jesus, but are ill-prepared in principle. They sorrowed over the prospect of death rather than rejoicing over the promise of resurrection. Now here's what I've told you. I had a conversation. I spoke to one of our elders last night on, on the phone for an hour and 30 minutes. We had this conversation and... It was a very interesting conversation because one of the things that I talked about, one of the things that we discussed was how that we, we hear preachers all the time. We, we've, been, we've been robbed of our identity by preachers because they'll get behind the pulpit and make absolutely unfounded and unscriptural statements like, well... We all sin a little more or less every day. Uh, the scripture said, he that is born of God, we're going to read it here in just a minute, he that is born of God sinneth not. If any man does sin, he has an advocate with the Father, the righteous Christ. Uh, we'll get to that here in just a minute. But, but preachers, preachers have crippled us in the pursuit of our purpose and left us ill-prepared because they make unfounded statements like, well, you got to sin a little every day. 
And one of the things that we were discussing was the statement I heard a preacher last week. He got up and he spent 30 minutes preaching about how that ain't nobody perfect. Well, ain't nobody perfect, y'all. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. Ain't nobody perfect. Ain't never been nobody perfect other than Jesus. Well, that right there is not true. The Bible tells us in the very first chapter of Job that Job was a, wait a minute, let me quote it. Let me say it just the way it was written, that Job was a perfect and upright man in all of his ways. Wasn't just Jesus that was perfect. Job was a perfect and upright man in all of his ways. But trouble still came to Job. Come on, somebody. David was a man after God's own heart. But yet he lied. He committed adultery to cover his tracks. He had his best friend murdered. Oh, y'all ain't up in here now. Amen. David was a man after God's own heart, but yet he had failures and he had fall. Why? Because adversity come knocking at his door and he was ill prepared. Now here's a man that knows all about preparation. Uh, uh, can I preach for just a second? I know the crowd's a little small today, but I'm going to preach up in here for just a minute anyhow. Look at this. David was a man that knew about preparation because when Goliath came to face the children of Israel and everybody was afraid, even Saul, the Bible said no one would confront Goliath, even this mighty king who was strong in valor and virtue by the name of Saul, he wouldn't face Goliath. Everybody in Israel, all the armies were afraid. But the Bible said that David had a different testimony. And when he approached the king about having his opportunity to confront that giant, his response was this. He said, oh king, he said, even as I have been a shepherd, and when a bear came and a lion came to steal my sheep away, he said, I went, and with these hands, I wrestled my sheep out of the mouth of a bear. Uh, I like how it describes his conflict with the lion. The Bible said that David declared, I grabbed him by the beard, and I smote him. You, you talk about, this is a 12-year-old boy, and he's talking about snatching a lion by its mane and whacking him and taking his sheep back. What is this about, Bishop? It's about David when he looked at Goliath. He said, I'm coming to the Goliath not just with equipment. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. I don't just have a sword and a spear. I don't just have a sling and a stone. He said, check this out, Saul. I've been prepared in a shepherd's field fighting bears and lions. I know what trouble is, and I'm prepared when I have to face trouble problem with the church today is we fail to prepare. We want the stuff. We want the equipment. But we don't want to prepare to use it. Oh. <laughs> See, oftentimes God gives us, and this is what the conversation was last night. That if Jesus said, and these are his words, I didn't write these, he wrote them. I used to say it like this, God wrote them, I quote them. He said, be you perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. Now, I didn't write that. I'm just reciting to you what Jesus said. Now, if Jesus commanded us to be perfect as the Father in heaven is, is perfect. Here's the thing. Whatever he tells you to do, 
He also gives you the equipment to accomplish what he tells you to do. Now, you don't have the equipment outside of him. But he will equip you and give you the strength and the ability and the equipment. So oft time we have all the equipment to complete our task. But the problem is we have not put in the necessary fuel to keep the equipment running. Uh, and we run out of gas. I've seen it in the church. Remember how folks used to be on fire for God. You, you, you ever met? I, I had somebody tell me two weeks ago, uh, they said, you know, I used to be really on the front lines of the Christian battle. I used to be on fire for God. I used to pray in the altar. I used to seek the Lord. I used to sing in the choir. I used to be on the praise team. I, I used to lead prayer in service. I used to, I used to. And I said, what happened? And the words that this sister told me, she said, I just ran out of gas. And I see it all over the place. We want to equip you, but we don't want you to understand how to fuel up. And you fuel up on principle. Now look at Matthew 25, and I'm going to show you this. Matthew chapter 25. Verse 1, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise, five of them were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said unto the wise, Give, give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. The wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, they that were ready went in with him to be to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Now watch this. Here's the power of this parable. Notice there were ten virgins. There was nothing wrong with the women themselves. Help me, Jesus. They were innocent. They had righteous conduct. But righteous conduct is not enough. Sinlessness, sinlessness is the optimal existence. But if one should sin, we have an advocate, a representative, 1 John 2 and 1. My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus the righteous. But watch this, folks. Innocence and righteous conduct are not enough. One must become the righteousness of God. In other words, we must become the vessels that are full of all that is right. That's principle. Uh, help me, Holy Ghost. That's the fuel. That's the fuel that keeps us moving, that keeps our lamps burning. You may have all the equipment. I know y'all don't want this kind of preaching, but that's all right. I'll preach it anyhow. You may have all the equipment, but if you don't have the fuel of principle, hey, put on my shot. When they lie on you, you're going to run out of fuel. If you've not become 
the righteousness of God. If you've not become a vessel that is full of all that is right, because I'm going to tell you something, baby. When the pressure gets on you, it will it will test not only your equipment, but it will test the fuel that is powering your equipment. So when the pressure is on and you're light on, you'll, you'll find out. Have I got the fuel to keep my lamp burning? Oh, when they talk about you, when they do you wrong, do I have the fuel to do them right? And I know y'all don't want it. I know you don't want it. Oh, help me, Jesus. Uh, when sickness attacks your body, do I have the fuel to keep on trusting that with his stripes I've already been healed? Uh, when you look at your bank account and it's more empty than it is full, then you can look at the gauge on your equipment and ask yourself this question, do I have enough fuel to keep on trusting God to be my source uh, and my supply in the time of lack uh, and in the time of famine? Uh, I want you to understand today, it's principle is what fuels the equipment that God gives you to light your path and if you're not full of principle you'll fail miserably and you'll be just like these disciples on a Saturday of sorrow not realizing that if Jesus said it we can rejoice because it shall come to pass hallelujah they heard what Jesus said they just didn't have the fuel of principle to get there with him. They all had lamps. The ten virgins, they were all innocent. They were all pure. And they all had lamps. See, folks, can I tell you something? It's not enough just to have the light. You got to become the light. Amen. Matthew 5 and 14. That's right, Sister Drennan. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. People say all the time, say, Bishop, Jesus is the light of the world. No, you're the light of the world. Jesus said, You're the light of the world. Jesus said, You're the salt of the earth. They all were innocent. They all had lamps. They all went forth. And I want you to notice this. They all slept and slumbered. But they also all arose. And they all trimmed their lamps. But there were only five. Watch this. That had vessels. They all had oil in their lamps. But only five brought oil for when that oil ran out. Can I work this? Because I'm going to tell you something, but I'm talking about being prepared today. I'm talking about folks that are ill-prepared and the church as a whole is ill-prepared. You're ill-prepared for the fact that there's going to be some stuff that's going to try you to the point of breaking you. And the question ain't if you got oil in your lamp. The question is if you brought oil for the fight after the light goes out. You're going to have things that are going to test you to the point of breaking you. And it's one thing to stay lit up until that point. The question is, can you keep, do you have what it takes to keep that fire burning after you've been broken, beaten, abused, pushed down, stomped on, trampled on, and left for dead? Do you still have oil? Do you still have principle? Oh, Shabbat. Can you still love? Can you still forgive? Can you still have hope? 
Can you still operate in faith? Can you still trust God? Can you still believe the promise? Come on, can I get some help in this Presbyterian church today? After you found yourself with your back against the wall and nowhere to go, after you found yourself at the end of your rope and nothing to hold on to, do you still have principle? Do you still have hope in Jesus? The Bible said that only five had a vessel. There was only five that brought fuel for what was to come. Brother Bivens, it's easy to trust God and to burn with faith and fire when he's breaking bread and multiplying fishes. But can you trust God? Did you bring enough to see you through? Oh, help me, Jesus. So watch it, folks. The Bible tells us that Jesus broke the bread and multiplied the fish and filled up the baskets and put the disciples in a boat and told them to go to the other side. Oh, they were all excited about the bread. They were all excited about the fish. They were all excited about the baskets. But when they got on the Sea of Gennesaret and the wind began to blow and the wind began to, uh, the waves began to rise and the ship began to be tossed up, Amen. Something happened to the oil that they had about the loaves. Something happened to the oil they had about the fish. Something happened to the oil they had when everything was being multiplied and blessed and prosperous. They found themselves sitting in the middle of a sea of trouble and they ran out of gas. And they had to run and wake Jesus up. See, here's the deal, folks. Jesus had been teaching them to be, uh, help me, Holy Ghost. And they get on the sea, and they didn't bring nothing for themselves. I preached this a few years ago, one of the greatest messages, sermons that God ever gave me. gathering up the scraps. He let, you know, we've been told wrong. You know, we've said that because the little boy gave his lunch, the little boy got the rem remnants of what was left. That's not true. The Bible said that the disciples gathered up the remnants in baskets and they took them with them on that ship. And the reason that they took them on that boat was as was as a reminder so that when you get out here on the sea and you get out of here in the storm and you get out here in the wind and the waves and the trouble and the difficulty and all the problems of life, you can pop the lid on that basket and look in and be reminded that the same God that gave me bread and fish in this basket on the shore is the same God that will give me bread and fish in my basket in the storm. Come on. It's the same God. So the Bible said that five were ill prepared. But five had Elion. The word Elion is a Greek word for oil or oil olive. It's the anointing oil. It's the Christos. It's the oil of principle. Wisdom is found in principle. Principle is not religious piety. There's no oil in religious piety. Just because you look sanctified. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. Amen. I'm going to tell you right now, long dress, long skirt, long sleeves, long hair. None of that stuff will see you through the storm. Amen. Not going to the movies, not going on vacation, not going to the swimming hole. Not, none of that stuff will see you through the storm. Y'all ain't in here now. 
I get I get so aggravated and so irritated and agitated at preachers. Amen. The, they, the, the Bible said Jesus dealt with Pharisees who were the preachers of his day. And he said, here's what you do. He said, you strain at a gnat and you swallow a camel. Hello? Huh? Uh, you don't want the fly in your soup. Amen. Hello? Amen. You don't want to fly in your soup. You don't want to fly in your soup. But yet then you'll swallow a whole camel. Strain it in that. You swallow the camel. It's the same thing Jesus said. You're trying to get a speck out of your brother's eye. Well, you've got a whole beam in your own eye. We're good at that in the church. Hello? We're real good at that in the church. The blind leading the blind. Reason I tell folks all the time, you got to be careful who you listen to. Uh, help me, Jesus. People call me all the time talking about, did you hear this preacher? Did you hear that preacher? And so and so said, and that one said, and Creflo said, and Kenneth said, and this one said. And I just tell folks, listen, you got to be careful who you listen to. I ain't got nothing against Creflo. I ain't got nothing against Kenneth. I ain't got nothing against Jimmy. I ain't got nothing against any of them. Let them say whatever they say. But I got to be discerning enough to know what I need to hear and what I need to receive and what I need to listen to. I got to be careful who, who speaks to me and that's not just true in ministry it's not just true in religiosity that's not just true in church life that's true in your own personal life amen everything from your friends to your family to your co-workers you got to be careful who you listen to because there's a whole lot of folks out there that'll speak ill advice into your ear that'll cause you to be unprepared when the rubber meets the road and trouble comes knocking at your door be careful who you listen to. Amen. Folks will turn you, twist you. That's all right, baby. I feel like crying sometimes, too. Amen. Can I say this to you today? God never sends you to the altar of covenant without equipping you with the tools to make the journey to your divine purpose. What happens is that we fail to maintain the proper principle for the trip. My business is a business that revolves around the use of heavy machinery. It's a far cry from my collegiate studies. I never dreamed that I would be having heavy machinery and moving materials and doing all of this kind of stuff and but it just kind of fell into it. And here's something that I found, folks. If you don't make sure that your equipment is fueled up, you can have all the work in the world and the finest equipment known to man. But none of it will work if there's not enough fuel in the tank. See, some folks, and I'm going to tell you, it ain't cheap. It ain't cheap. It ain't cheap. You start, Caleb helps us, works with us, and uh, you start lifting 20 ton at a time with a machine running on diesel fuel. And you're using 100 gallon of fuel in that machine a day. I don't know if y'all have seen how high diesel is yet. It's 500, 500 and, about $530 for a 100 gallon. 
you're running 100 that gallon a day. See, here's the thing, folks. A lot of folks don't count the cost. Huh? We don't understand that there is a price to pay for promise. Ah, Jesus. Some folks enter into covenant foolishly without counting the cost. Jesus said in Luke chapter 14 and verse 18, For which of you intending to build a tower setteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? It's not what equipment you have to work with. It's what fuel you have to fire the equipment. These disciples were ill-prepared for the sorrow of Saturday. I look around us today and I see folks that are ill-prepared for the struggle ahead. We fill our hearts. I'm, I'm trying to close right now. We fill our hearts full of doubt and unbelief. We fill our hearts full of dismay and disarray. We fill our hearts with envy and hatred and strife. We fill our hearts with jealousy and contention. We fill our hearts with all the works of the flesh. We've got the equipment to make this journey. But our hearts are empty and void of the fuel of faith and love and hope that is required to keep that light burning. I talked about this years ago as I come to the final few moments of this service. I talked about this. I was at my dad's house and uh, in Ohio. And this is back before the instant pot. I don't know if anybody's got an instant pot or not, but I love that thing. This was back before the instant pot. He had an old, regular old pressure cooker. You put the little whirly bird on top. That's what I always called it, the weight. And you build that thing up to pressure. And I always loved, and, and some people disagree with me about this, but some of the best pinto beans that I've ever ate in my life have been pinto beans. I don't like pinto beans out of a slow cooker because I don't, for some reason, pinto beans in a slow cooker don't get the soup in there good and thick. I don't like it clear and watery. I like it good and thick. There was something about that pressure cooker. You could put a big old slab of salt pork in there with some pinto beans, and you could tighten that lid down and put that little weight on the top of that thing and crank up the heat, and that thing would start... And it would start pressure cooking those beans, and it sealed in the flavor, and it sealed in the juices, and it made the most beautiful soup. So I was at my dad's house and I thought, you know what? I'm going to make us a pot of beans while I'm here. So I go in there and I get his pressure cooker out and I, I washed off some beans, went through them, sorted through them, see if I could find a nail or whatever. You, you know, sometimes in pinto beans, you'll find a rock. You'll find a, uh, the, the last pot of pinto beans I made around uh, the house was, uh, I, I found a, a rubber washer in, <laughs> in the bag of beans. Get, wash them off, got to put them in there. Put the water in there, turned up the heat, got it cooking. And I'm looking outside and I'm like, hmm, I ought to cut dad's grass. Looks like it could be cut before he gets here. So I go out and get his lawnmower and I'm out there mowing the grass. So I'm like, well, I might as well hit, hit the weed eating while I'm out here too and hit the weed eating. I was like, it's looking pretty good. And let me get, let me work on his little flower bed here a little bit. And then it dawned on me. Oh no, 
I forgot the beans. And I went running back in the house, but it was too late. Because there had been so much pressure built up in that pot, in that pressure cooker, that the pop, the top, popped off of that pressure cooker and all of the beans and soup and everything had sprayed all over the wall, the cabinets, the countertops. It was a nasty, hot mess in there. And what was left in the bottom of the cooker was scorching under high heat conditions. And it dawned on me that that's exactly what happens to us if we're not filled with the right principle in life. Because baby, let me tell you today, and I know some of y'all ain't wanting to shout on this sermon, but I'm going to tell you, and you may not like it, but it's true. I don't care who you are, how spiritual you are, how anointed you are, how often you go to church, how much tithe you pay. It doesn't matter to me, baby. I'm here to tell you and to be the one to forewarn you that life has a way of turning up the heat on your situation. And if you don't have the good stuff on the inside when the top pops off amen you're gonna spew out all the stuff that indicates that you're defeated in spite of having all the outward equipment to get the job done that's the reason you gotta fill your soul your mind your will and your emotions as we stand please all over this building today you got to fill your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions. you got to fill your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions. Listen to me, baby. I'm here to tell you right now. If you can ever get the right thing in your mind, if you can ever have the right feelings in your emotions and if you can ever get the will to do the right thing in the sight of God you will have the power of the principle that will fuel and empower you for anything that may come your way we said it repetitive what you think about you bring about your mind is your biggest battleground The word heart, H-E-A-R-T, the word heart in the scripture is always the same original Hebrew word or Greek word as soul. Suke is translated both heart and soul. So your heart or your soul, that's the same thing. So when David said, I've hid your word in my heart that I might not sin against you, he was actually saying, I put your word in my soul. I got your word in my mind. I got your word motivating and controlling my will. And I got your word overseeing my emotions. That's what keeps me in the place of being sinless and perfected in the eyes of God is because I put His Word in the most valuable, vulnerable, and volatile places in my life's existence. We need His Word to fill us. I want you to bow your heads, please, all over this building today. Father, we thank you today. And we praise you. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for inspiring us. Thank you for anointing us. Thank you for filling us with your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. Now, Lord, we pray in this place today that the anointing of God, that the power of God, that the presence of God Lord, would somehow in some way captivate us in our spirits. Bring us to the place, Lord, to where we're prepared for what may come.
We thank you that you have equipped us. We thank you that you have given us all the necessary tools to make this journey. Now, Lord, we pray that you will strengthen our hearts to be prepared for the struggles and the battle ahead. We know that if we do that through the power of the Holy Ghost, according to the words of Jude, he said, build yourself up upon your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Help us, Lord, to fill our vessels with the oil of principle, with love and hope and peace. If we do these things, Lord, we know that we will never fail. Now, Lord, we pray for wayward children. We ask, oh God, that you would touch their hearts and their lives. You'll turn them. We pray for broken relationships. We ask, oh God, that you will pour in the oil and the wine that restores. Lord, we pray for physical sickness and ailment. Send healing today. Let the balm of Gilead be present to heal every hurt, every ache, every pain, every disease, every infirmity, every sickness. Granted today in the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray for emotional discomfort. We pray, oh God, that the peace that passes all understanding would move on our minds. Lord, bring us to peace. In Jesus' name, we pray, oh God, for financial disparagency. We ask, oh God, today that you would break the back of poverty and that you would release the spirit of blessing and prosperity into the lives of your people. In the holy name of Jesus, we thank you for doing it today. Lord, we pray for hatred and unforgiveness. Lord, help us find the strength, oh Father God, to release and let go and let God we pray today, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Lord, that you would give us the faith and the hope and the ability to press toward the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus and lay our hand on the plow and not look back, to lay our eyes on the prize and run with, with hope and trust that the finish line is just in sight. For these things, we'll never fail to thank you and praise you and give you glory and honor for them all. We ask it in Christ's holy name. Amen. And let the saints of God say it, amen and amen. God bless you today. You may take your seats for just a moment. We're going to get ready to be dismissed today. We really want to thank you for being in service on this afternoon. God has been so good and gracious and kind to us by speaking his word to us. Now, I want to I want to make this announcement. There will be no Thursday night service this week. No Thursday night service here this week. I forgot to mention that earlier. We're going to use this Thursday night. I've got we're going to do some work on the roads. I want to get I, we were going to do it on a Saturday, but uh, uh, there's a lot happening going on on a Saturday. On, on Saturdays, so this week we're going to do some work on the roads in preparation for camp meeting, uh, and we've got a bunch of other stuff we need to do around the tent, uh, so no service this Thursday night in preparation. We'll keep you posted on how we're going to approach Thursday nights leading up to camp meeting, but just right now, no Thursday night service this Thursday night. We'll be doing some work around here in preparation for camp meeting, we got to get our pavilion ready to go. So we still got a lot on our plate and are going to take full advantage of our time for that. I will be live streaming one night this week. I don't know which it'll be. So I'll come to you with a, a quick word one night this week on live stream. All right. Okay, everybody. Here's what we're going to get ready to do. We're going to get ready to receive our tithing offering today as we get ready to be dismissed. I want to ask you to prayerfully consider how God would have you to give on today. We really need your help as we prepare for camp meeting 2022. Uh, it's It costs quite a bit of money to buy food for everybody. God has always provided. Amen. God's always made a way. We want to ask you today to ask God how he would have you to give and we'd like to ask you to sow into this good ground. This is fertile ground. And it will, look folks, 
You can't sow. I don't care what anybody, I don't care what Creflo says, I don't care what anybody says. The seed you sow will be the thing you grow. It's an irrevocable law of God that if you give, it shall be given back to you. That when you, whatever you sow, that shall you also reap. That's not just necessarily money. Can I say this to you? If you sow love, you get love back. If you sow drama, you'll get a life of drama. If you sow peace, you'll get a life of peace. If you sow goodness, you'll get goodness. If you sow financially into the kingdom of God, you'll reap financially from the benefits of heaven. So we're asking you today, ask God how he'd have you to give. If you want to give your tithe and offering and you're not here local, you can always do that. We have distant members, folks that aren't even in our city, folks that aren't in our state. We even have folks that are not in our country. Amen. I had a brother from Africa. Listen to this. I'm going to tell this and we're going to let you go. I had a brother from Africa sent me a message last year. And he said, Bishop, he said, the fellowship and the ministry have been such a blessing to us down through the years. He said, this month, he said, and he's a pastor. He said, this month, I want to tithe off of our tithe into your ministry. Now, look, folks, most of the time, we're sending money to Africa. This brother said, I want to send some money from Africa to your ministry. And he said, so here's our tithe for the month. And he cash apped us $300 from Africa. From Africa to us. Amen. God told us that he was going to make us missionaries to the world. And we have been. We've been in eight foreign countries. And it just goes to show that the seed that we're sowing around the globe with this ministry is working when people in impover impoverished areas want to sow into this good soil because they know it'll bring good results and a good harvest. So today, give as unto the Lord. Now, if you'd like to give on Cash App, it's dollar sign Bishop Drennan on Cash App. If you'd like to give on Givelify, just look for the Word of Faith Family Worship Center on the Givelify app. If you'd like to give on Venmo, our Venmo uh, address is at Philly Faith Chapel on Venmo. Of course, if you'd like to give on PayPal, the easiest way to do that is simply go to our website and click on the giving tab, and you'll be taken to a safe, secure PayPal site. www.miracleministries.net is our website. If you're here, you want to give on your debit or credit card, see me after service. I'll help you process that. If you're making a check, make it payable to Word of Faith. If you're mailing an offering, mail it to... Philadelphia Faith Chapel, 198 Donaldson, 198 Donaldson, Philadelphia, Tennessee, and be sure to zip it up, 37846. All right? We good? Let's all stand, please, all over the building today. We're going to get ready to be dismissed. We appreciate you being here. Thank you for spending your Sunday afternoon with us in the presence of the Lord. We love you. All hearts and minds clear. Anything I'm forgetting? Anything I'm missing? Yeah, we're going to receive the offering as we're dismissed today. All right, everybody, if you would, please come and bring your offering to the Lord, no matter how large or how small it may be, and bless the Lord with your giving 